Thank you, Ms. Laura and Ms. Mariette and our threes and fours for leading us in such precious songs. Aren't they precious? Oh my goodness. I just think that the most precious, precious thing to Jesus' ears is to hearing little people sing his name. Um, and that brought me right into his throne this morning. Let's go ahead and stand. Let's continue to worship our holy God, the only one who could save us, the only one who could rescue us. Um, he is so worthy and he is so good. Let's sing this this morning. And who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. And what a such praises what other splendor outshines the sun what other majesty rules with justice only a holy God and come and behold him the
and I love you, Lord. And may your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no Jesus, you are so good, Lord. Father, will we not take for granted, God? Would it not just be something that we say, Father, that because, it, because it's become so natural to say, God, or we've become so um, used to saying it, Father, but that it would be something that we firmly stand in and proclaim, God, your goodness, your faithfulness, God. 
God, your goodness and your mercies are new every morning, Father. Lord, we thank you for them. Jesus, you are good. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You may go ahead and be seated as our little ones make their way up here this morning to lead you as well. I've got a couple of announcements for you. First of all, we welcome you if you are a visitor or you're new here. Um, we are excited and happy that you chose this morning to worship with us. There is a connect card in the pew in front of you if you would fill it out. Those of you that are also regular attenders or members, if you would go ahead and fill that out as well, or you can scan the connect, the Q, what is that thing called? A QR code, is that right? QR code in front of you and register your attendance. Just a couple things I wanna make you aware of before our um, elementary kids sing for us this morning. This Friday, March 29th at 7 a.m. is our Good Friday service, and so we look forward to having you guys here and um, remembering what Jesus did for us that morning as he went to the cross. We will be done and out of here by 7.30 so that those of you that need to make it to work can. Um, on April 14th from 12.30 to 2, our children's ministry, Miss Vicki, will be hosting a, um, it's called Wonderfully Made. It's a very important subject matter. If you have any questions about that, you can get in touch with Ms. Vicki or you can register with Terry Mayer, but all parents, I would urge you second grade and up to attend that um, conference or time of just talking about how God made us. Uh, we are beautifully and wonderfully made in his creation and in his image. Next week is Easter. We will have small groups after service, so make sure that you plan to stay for those. Um, and also on Sunday, April 28th, Ben, Banjo Ben and the Purple Holes will be here to lead us in a wonderful bluegrass morning of music. So mark that on your calendar, and I know it's going to be a special treat for us. But I give you our kids' choir. They're going to lead us this morning.
pray over I'm going to pray over our kids as they as they go to Miss Vicky. Go ahead. Jesus Lord, we just pray over these sweet precious children this morning, God. Father, that you would reveal yourself to them, Father, that you would make yourself known to them, God. Father, that they would be drawn to you. Lord, that they would know that they are created by you, God, that they were created for you, Lord. God, that they are beautifully and wonderfully made in your perfect image, Lord. Father, would you bless those that are with them week in and week out, pouring into their lives, God. Would they know your truth, Father? God, would you protect them? Would you keep them from the enemy, Jesus? Father, we thank you for our little ones, God. We thank you for their voices that so proclaim your name, their hearts that long to please you, God, and honor you. Lord, we love you. We praise your name in this place this morning. Amen. All right. So far, so good, man. What a great time together, right? All right. Your king is coming. So I'm David. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, Our senior pastor, John Mark Oliver, he is out on mission. He is training pastors in another country this week and well, last week and part of this coming week. Um, So pray for him. Pray for Frank Gilbert. They're together. Um, So last week we were in Daniel 7. This week we're not going to be in Daniel 8. (laughs) J-Mo gets that uh, after Easter when he's back up here. Thank the Lord, right? Um, So let's just, let's pray real quick. Oh Lord, we do thank you and we love you that you are the King, Lord, and we celebrate that you just made this story such a good one, Lord, that, that Jesus is, is, that he reigns, Lord, and that he is mighty and lifted up. God, uh, just bless this time that we have together today. I pray that we'll honor you in all of it and uh, that your, wor- your word will not return void, Lord. We love you. Amen. All right, so I've said it before, the Bible has a single storyline that runs throughout. It's the story of what went wrong with the world, what went wrong with mankind, and what God is doing about it. Um, We talked about uh, the big picture, kind of the grand narrative. It's a four-part creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. So creation is that God made it all, including man and woman. He made, he made the earth, he made the world, he made mankind, and he made it good. Man walked with God. They walked in the garden. They fellowshiped intimately with God. Well, man rebelled. That's the fall. Um, they disobeyed. They rebelled. They broke that fellowship with God. And so Jesus came and he was the Redeemer. He is the Redeemer. He made the path to correct, to heal, to restore, to reconcile that relationship with God. And so one day he'll come back and he will reign in a new heaven and a new earth. And that's the story of the Bible. So today we're in well, we're going to be in all over the place, but the, the, the main passage is Matthew chapter 21. So the three questions that I always ask when I read the Bible, when I teach the Bible, hopefully you're, you're learning these. Um, the first is, what does it say? The second, what does it mean? And the third, what shall I do? So it's, what does it say? What does it mean? What do I do? Um, Today, I'm thinking of it a little differently, Uh, not really differently, just with more words. So, what does it mean? Uh, What does it say is the setup? What does it mean is the payoff? And what do I do is the response, okay? Some of the, some teachers will tell you, observe, interpret, apply. It's the same thing. So, today, it's going to be the setup, the payoff, and the response. So, let's start with Matthew 21. If you don't have your Bible, there's one in the seat back in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you can take one of those with you. Um, So we're in Matthew chapter 21. And uh, uh, let's see, where am I? Uh, We're at the beginning, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem 
and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Of Galilee. Your king is coming. So we want a hero. We want a champion. We want a savior. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 through 3. You don't have to go there. I'm, I'm just speaking to go there. Um, Genesis 1 through 3. God created Adam. He gives Adam dominion over the earth. God is the king, and Adam has dominion. And then we follow the story through Noah. We get to Abraham, who's the father of the nations, and then his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and they changed his name, God changed his name to Israel, and then to Joseph in Egypt. After Joseph in Egypt was Moses and Joshua, and we get to a period of judges. So God is the king. It's a theocracy. He rules and leads Israel now at this point. All right, so this time of the judges is a time that's marked with confusion, there's chaos, anarchy. If you've not ever really spent any time in the book of Judges, there are some fantastic stories. There are some remarkable stories. And I don't necessarily mean fantastic and remarkable in like a clean, fun, easy and sweet way. Interesting stories, you should spend some time there. So, Judges uh, 16, let's see, Judges 17, verse 6, this is a good description of that period of time. Uh, Judges 17, 6, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Man, there was no king, and with that also, no trust in God to lead them. So Yahweh remembers his covenants. He had covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, but Israel seems to forget. God remembers, Israel forgets. And we mentioned this last week, Hosea chapter 13, he said, uh, Hosea says, they were filled and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. Yahweh remembers, Israel forgets. So we're in the time of Judges and uh, Samuel is in a sense leading. Um, he is a a man of God, and the people know that. They, they know that he is a prophet and uh, that he is from God. Here's an interesting passage in 1 Samuel, and we're heading toward, we're in the period of Judges, no king. We're heading toward Israel asking for a king. Uh, this is kind of a long passage, so bear with it. It's, I'm adding it because it's, it's relevant, and, and, and it's, it's, really, it's really right on. So this is, this is in Samuel. Chapter 8, verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, 
Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. They have rejected me from being the king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all of the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will, make, he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. So Samuel finds a king. He, uh, he anoints Saul. He's handsome. He's charismatic, charismatic. And he goes on to have some success. But eventually he turns from God. He's disobedient. He rejects the word of the Lord. Well, then comes David. Samuel anoints David to be the king. And this is a time of flourishing. David conquers Jerusalem. He makes the capital city there. He brings in the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> and then his son is Samuel, uh, excuse me, Solomon. So Solomon builds the temple, and then after Solomon, the line of the kings drifts further and further from fellowship with God. So Samuel's words ring true in Israel, and for generation after generation, they, they, they wandered further and further from fellowship with God. And so through the generations, Israel longed for a king like David, in the line of David. They wanted the king like David to rule and fight their battles for them. All right, so Genesis, back to Genesis chapter one. This is verse 28, and God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gives dominion of the earth to Adam. We said this last week in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, the ancient of days gave to the Son of Man dominion, and to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So Daniel, the, uh, the ancient of the days, God passes dominion to the Son of Man. And this is a kingdom, we said last week, this is a kingdom that will never end. It will, never, it will be left not to another. Later in Genesis, right at the end, Jacob is about to die, and he prophesies over his 12 sons. This is in chapter 49, verses 10 and 11. The scepter shall not put depart from Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. 
This is verse 11. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of the grapes. So this is about his son, Judah. And so he went through all 12 of the sons and he's had, he had prophecy over each of them. This is Judah. And David is in the line of Judah. Jesus is in the line of Judah. We're going to come back to this in just a minute. So in Matthew 21, Matthew quotes Zechariah 9, verse 9. He, 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 he refers back to Zephaniah's, excuse me, Zechariah's prophecy. So, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. So this is the passage that Matthew quoted that he referred to uh, before Jesus or as Jesus was entering Jerusalem. So Zechariah is post-exile. He was born in Babylon, but he returned to Judah when his family went back. So the first half of Zechariah's book, chapters 1 through 8, he kind of rebu rebukes and encourages Judah. He wants them to rebuild the temple. You know, they've, they've, they're, they've been released from exile. They're going back home to Jerusalem, and he's encouraging them to rebuild the temple. The second half of his book, verses nine, uh, chapters 9 through 14, he encourages Israel because of their foretold future. And he knows that building the temple is building their future. So, after Zechariah, there came 400 years of prophetic silence. And you can see that Micah ends, Matthew begins, there's a space of 400 years. So that 400 years of silence ends with what might be one of the least preached passages in the Bible. <laughs> Are you familiar with Matthew chapter 1? If you're close to it, flip over and look at verses 1 through uh, 17. Yeah, least preached. It's a genealogy. And you, our, our, our children did not memorize these verses in Awana. <laughs> so I'm not going to read it, but I want to I bring it up because we're going we're to talk about it a little bit again in a minute. Um, but Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, is the genealogy from Abraham to Jesus. So it is entirely significant. Um, it is a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So like I said, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so the procession to Jerusalem in Matthew 21, but we also see it in Mark 11, Luke 19 and John 12. All four of the gospel writers told the account of Jesus entering Jerusalem before the Passover on the donkey. All right, all four stories, the people lay their cloaks on the ground, they lay branches in his path, and they're singing and shouting. It's Psalm 118. You can go back and read it later. Hosanna, blessed be the, you know, comes in the name of the Lord, right? So they're singing Psalm 118. All right, so we've been all over the place. Goodness gracious, we've been in the Old Testament, we've been in the New Testament, and uh, let's, let's try and make some, some sense of this. So I said the genealogy in chapter one of Matthew is the bridge. It's an emphasis on Jewish heritage. You know, they started Abraham, they didn't, he didn't start at Adam. He started at Abraham, and Abraham is the father of the nations. He's the father of Israel, essentially the, the father of the Jews. And we go from Abraham to David, and who is David? Anyone but the, he's the, the king. Like, when you think of Jewish kings, it's King David that, that you think about. 
So the, from David to Babylon, that's the exile, another big moment in their, in their heritage, in their history. And then from Babylon, the exile to Jesus. So there are three phases of the, of the, of the genealogy, 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to Babylon, and then 14 generations from Babylon to Jesus. And so Matthew is emphasizing the Jewish heritage and Jesus' descendancy from Abraham and from David. This is the kingly line. So back at um, Genesis 49, this was when Israel, when, Ju uh, when Jacob was prophesying over his sons, and he prophesied over Judah, the line of Judah, he says, Judah's scepter shall not depart. His ruler's staff will remain between his feet. He's saying that that kingly line is going to come from and stay in the line of Judah. And then in verse 11, man, he talks about binding the foal, the donkey's colt, just like Jesus showed at the, uh, the triumphal entry. And it's interesting here, it says binding his colt to the vine, the donkey's colt to the choice vine. Where else do we hear about the vine? You know, Jesus in John, he is the vine and we are the branches and Man, this is Genesis chapter, this is Genesis. This is the beginning of the Bible and we're already talking about Jesus and the vine and his, uh, and, and his approach to, to his kingdom. I think that's exciting. All right, so, and back to uh, Zephaniah chapter nine where Matthew quotes it. Um, so I've, I've jumped, ahead, jumped ahead a little bit. We are in... Section two, this is question two, what does it mean? So we talked about what, is, uh, what does it say? That was the setup. Now we're in question two, what does it mean? Here's the, here's the payoff. So your king is coming. Now Zechariah nine says he's humble, he's lowly, he's riding on a donkey. In Matthew, he's finally here. They've been waiting for generations and generations, and they recognize the messianic implications. They realize that, yeah, this guy is the Messiah. Now, they put out the cloaks, they put out the branches, and they are communicating triumph, victory, and peace. That's the symbolism of the cloaks, and the branches. He's coming in peaceful on a lowly donkey. He is telling them that the battle is already won. He is in peaceful confidence. Uh, Zechariah 9, cha uh, verse, chapter 9, verse 10 says that all the other nations are disarmed and that he speaks peace to all nations from sea to sea to the ends of the earth. How many times have we heard that language? All nations and the end of the earth. This is all setting us up for Jesus' great commission. All right. Uh, chapter 9, verse 11 says, He will set prisoners free by the blood of his covenant. By the blood of his covenant. So Yahweh remembers. He remembers his covenants. He remembers the covenant promises of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and now the covenant in blood is his new covenant. And Jesus is ushering in this kingdom that is the new covenant in his blood. Zechariah's name. This is great. Zechariah's name, it translate, translates Yahweh remembers. He remembers Abraham's land, the blessing, the offspring. 
He remembers carrying Moses from Egypt to the wilderness and Israel to the promised land. He remembers the deliverance from exile. This was a this was all common in Hebrew history and in their education as they were raised and brought up. Yahweh remembers and they forget. Yahweh remembers and Israel forgets. Hosea 13, they were full, therefore they forgot me. Genesis 8, verse 1, God remembered Noah. Deuteronomy 5, 15, Israel says, Israel, excuse me, God says, Israel, remember your slavery. Psalm 119, remember the word of God. Store it, hide it in your heart. Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath. Luke 22 and the Lord's Supper, remember his broken body and his poured out blood. Remember, remember my word. Post it on your doors, in front of your face, including your refrigerator magnets, your bumper stickers, and your bathroom mirror. Post it everywhere. Tim Keller says that to remember something is to put it back together. You're restoring something that was dismembered. So to remember is to put it back together. You're, re you're remembering something that was broken or separated. So remember, pay attention, think about it, call it to mind. Don't forget. Identify with the past and let it shape your future. Identify the past, identify with the past, and let your present be shaped by it. So as Jesus approached Jerusalem, some of the crowd was walking with him, some of the crowd was ahead of him. It was a, just a throng of people. And these were people that had been living in anticipation of the coming king, in anticipation of the Messiah. They were looking for a military political hero in the line of David that would fight their battles, that would conquer Rome and would free them from Roman domination. They had expectations. They recognized the messianic implications, but not the significance of the lowly, peaceful donkey. This victorious, lowly, peaceful king was not what they expected. He didn't come to defeat an earthly kingdom. He didn't come to vanquish Caesar. He wasn't there for political, earthly, physical triumph. When, Jesus, when Judas betrayed Jesus to the chief priests and elders, he thought he was forcing Jesus' hand. He thought he was ushering in. Judas thought that he himself was going to usher in Jesus' kingdom. He thought when he turned him over to be arrested that Jesus would fight back. He thought that Jesus would start the rebellion and that he would take down Rome. Jesus ushered in his kingdom on the back of a donkey. He made his royal procession just as it was foretold by Zechariah. He came for a spiritual exodus, freedom from spiritual exile. He came humbly on the donkey for his own suffering and death. He came to defeat Satan. He came to vanquish sin. What does it say? What does it mean? What shall we do? I gave you the setup, the payoff. Now it's time for your response. Your king is coming. When we read scripture, when we study the Bible, 
when we read and study in the light of the Messiah, in the light of the King, in the light of Jesus, what's God up to in this passage? What's he doing in all of these passages? What do they say about him? What do they say about his nature and his character? In the light of what he's doing and what he's like, how should it transform me? How should it change me? How should it renew me? In the light of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, here are four quick jewels to put in your purse. Number one, change your mind. Be transformed. Jesus might not be like you expect him to be. God might not be like you assume that he is. He might not be doing or he might not do what you expect him to do. Sometimes observe that people want to identify what is permissible. Like, how far can I go? Like, what's, you know, how deep can I get in this and it still be okay? They want to know how far they can go. They want to know what their boundaries are because they want to get as close to them as they can. How can I, how, how can I approach that line? How far can I go and still not get away from God? Change your thinking on this. Change your mind on this. Permissible is not necessarily beneficial. Let him transform your thinking to be like his. And it will likely not look like what you expect. Number one, change your mind. Number two, remember him. Don't be like Israel in Hosea 13. They were full and they forgot him. Identify with the past and let the present be shaped by it. If you have dismembered God in your life, if you've put up walls or barriers to him or what he's trying to say and do in your life, if you've put up, if you've put up a defense against him, remember him. Reassociate with him. Recall him to your mind and heart. Restore your attention to him. He remembers his covenants. He remembers us. Don't forget him. One, change your mind. Two, remember him. Three, don't miss him. He's at work right in front of you. When I go to the refrigerator, I frequently can't, I frequently can't find what I'm looking for. And it's right there. Always right there in front of me. So we've been all over the Bible today. We've covered a lot of ground. And I'm not smart enough to say anything confusing. Jesus is the king. All through Matthew's gospel, Jesus teaches about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. This is his kingdom. The son of man's dominion, the kingdom that will last forever, ever. He's not hiding from you. Don't miss him. Change your mind. Remember him. Don't miss him and respond. Number four, respond. You are not a spectator, you are a participant. You didn't come to church today, you are the church today. Jesus longs for your attention and your affection. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a disciple and you're not walking with him or in his spirit today, 
He loves you. He longs for you. Repent from whatever it is that you're putting in the way. If you don't know him, if you've never had an encounter with him authentically, and today maybe you've heard something or felt something or sensed something for the first time, his plan is restoration. He wants to remember you. He wants to put you back together. He wants to reconcile your mess with his unending love and his kingdom. He made the way for reconciliation. A few days after his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, man, they were celebrating, they were partying, they were shouting, they were singing, they were praising the Lord. A few days later, they killed him. He was brutally murdered. His kingdom is fulfilled by his sacrifice. He was coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. And he is the final Passover lamb. He's the Lamb of God, and his death fulfills the path to redemption. His death paid the price for the sins of the world. He paid the price for your rebellion and hate. And on the third day following his death, his lifeless body was resurrected. He walked in new life. His resurrection conquered death, and you and I have the same access to this new life. And that's in the power of his resurrection. He ascended to heaven. He promised to return one day and he'll rule and reign in a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus wants to walk with you in new life with him. You should trust him and begin following him today. Before you leave the building, Find somebody that you can trust that can help you sort it out. If you don't know anybody, then grab the closest person that you can and they can get you to somebody that can help you. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you are the king. You're the king forever. Your kingdom will not pass to anyone. Lord, we celebrate that. And even though we sang your praises on the approach and then beat you in the, into the ground, Lord, you still forgive us. You still love us. And you made the way for redemption and restoration. Lord, we thank you and love you. Just about to dismiss. Make sure that you uh, go to your small groups. If you don't, uh, if you don't have a small group, or if you're afraid of them, <laughs> be courageous today. It's such a big part of being the church. Being able to be in a small group of of other people who can encourage you and help train you and love on you. Don't be afraid of it. All right. Go get them. <laughs> <laughs>